again, I, I think a lot of times you guys will be, be able to analyze current popular African American culture, current popular culture better than me. I mean, I'm old, right? You, you know a lot more what he's talking about than I um, do. What I want to do, though, is think about the themes. Like we did this last time with the Jay the Life song. I try to think about some of the themes that are coming up in this song. Um, all I told you was to think about this notion of black identity, African American identity, how he's defining it. Um, so I want to hear what you hear. I put some things up on the board um, that may come up in this song. But what, what do you sort of hear in terms of these lyrics? How is he defining um, black or African American for himself? Uh, he's definitely defining it as an individual. How is he doing that? Okay. Okay. It's a notion that African American religion is particularly important in African American history. Um, several scholars have said that the two main social institutions in the African American community throughout history have been the family and the church, going back to slavery and beyond. Right? Those are sort of the two things that people have looked to as helping people to survive and get through uh, and make it despite difficult circumstances, and they still remain important. All right? So he, the fact that he references uh, both religion and family here is significant. He says, uh, what does he say about church? He says some, some interesting interesting things. Uh, he does say he's in church on Sunday, Sunday morning, but, huh? So he's out on Saturday night, but he still makes it to church, right? This is a notion, actually, the minister of my church said that last week. Like, some of you got the same clothes on you had on at the club last night, right? This notion of kind of being both secular and spiritual at the same time. He's kind of playing on that and almost playing on that stereotype in a sense, too. He's still a fairly young person, so um, maybe that's not surprising that he would kind of um, use that humor in that way, um, but also make reference to particularly important themes in African American history, African American culture. So that's a good one. What else do you hear in terms of his definition of blackness for himself? Okay. His, he wants his kids looking real nice. What do you think about that? I think that's a significant theme to, to make reference to. In some ways, this song is kind of surprising. Right? We think about what artists put out there in terms of what's kind of popular. Right? That's a really significant point he's making. Ever since history, like black people have been deprived in the black family by how people, how they want things to go outside. Okay. Yeah, this notion of pride. You know what I'm saying? They still want to look, feel good about themselves. So that's why they're dressing up. Good. Clothes are often very symbolic, right? Culturally symbolic, whether you have money in the bank or not. Especially you want your children looking a certain way. I remember we used to get in trouble when my trying to leave the house. My mom's like, you're not going out like that. I'm like, what do you mean? It's fine. You're not going to get poles. And I'm like, well, I got to impress. You know, that was always my thing. It's like, you got to impress me, first of all. You're not going outside. <laughs> so I learned to change. Um, it's really interesting, this notion of appearance and culture. And really how culture and clothing is very political in a sense, too. This came up a few years ago. I remember there was uh, um, some press about laws in Atlanta that were going to be changed about uh, sagging. Uh, you get a fine, $200 for sagging, I think it was. And folks were like, oh my goodness, $200. Right? This notion of um, um, even respectability. You know, you should, your pants should be hanging down. I still have some trouble with that myself, so you'll constantly see me uh, adjusting. But uh, and my mom and me had battles over that. I guess that came up at a certain time period where that was OK. It was not OK with her generation at all. Um, and so this culture is very political. Right? We're often going to talk about culture and, and see how political it is. I think normally we tend to think of those two things as separate. Right? We think of politics is over here, like last night was the Iowa caucus and all that, right? Then we think of culture over here, music and food and religion. We don't think of them coming together, but they often are very similar. They often are intersecting. They often are the same thing, especially for African Americans. Right? African American culture has been interpreted as representing this entire group of people. Right, and so they, they had to pay particular attention to their culture and how others view them. Right? This is a, a really major part of identity. Because one part of your identity is how you define yourself. Right? That's how we all want to, as you know, Americans or what have you, want to define yourself as an individual. Yet, you've always also had to think about how others view you. Right? In African American history, sometimes this might be a matter of life and death. I think about something like lynching. Most lynching victims were people in the wrong place at the wrong time, people that looked like somebody. Uh, somebody got away, so they lynched someone else. So it literally was a matter of life and death. Uh, this is not unfamiliar. Uh, women know all about this. Right? You're walking home on a dark street. You've got to think about everything around you, how people are viewing you, how you might be dressed. 
right? Yes, you can wear what you want to wear, but yes, it might complicate things. Right? You have a job interview. How you how you choose to dress for that? My sister was like, it took me hours to get dressed for this interview. I'm like, what are you talking about? She's like, I wanted to be, you know, feminine, but not show too much. I wanted to be professional, but not stuffy. Just like, dang, you know, I just so I throw on a button-up shirt and go, right? So this this is not just about race. This could be about gender, about class, about any number of things. And again, about representation. So it's interesting that that comes up, in particular for his child. He's not even talking about himself in that instance, but about the next generation. Right? This idea of the next generation. This is very um, related to kind of the notion of the American dream. Uh, well, we use that phrase a lot. The American dream is kind of this thing in American history, American culture, that um, it really has two parts to it. One part of the American dream is this idea, some say it's a myth, some say it's very real, that uh, if you work hard, you can be anything you want to be. Right? That the United States is different than the old world of Europe where you had to be born. You know, if you weren't born you know, into a royal family, you weren't going to be the leader of, of the country, right? Monarchy and all of that. But in a democratic society, if you work hard, go to school, pull yourself up by your bootstraps, you can be anything. Right? Obama can be president, right? So I think we understand this in terms of both the American and maybe an African-American dream. That's one part of the American dream. You work hard. In the course of one lifetime, you can change your circumstances. Probably just as important, though, the kind of second part of this American dream is the next generation, right? your children. Those of you with children know all about this. You want your children to do better than you, have more opportunities than you had. Right? All good parents really want that. If you worked in a factory your whole life, you might not want your child to do the same thing. Say, you know what, I'm going to be 16 hours a day in in this dangerous factory. You go to school. Right? You be the foreman of the factory. You own the factory. Right? We always kind of want the next generation to do better. But he's almost you know, making that point there. I want my child to look a certain way. It's particularly important from a generational perspective. Right? That's really significant when you think about it in, in African American history. It's always been this complicated thing, really for all Americans, but especially in African American history. So it's interesting that that comes up in his definition of black. What else? What else comes up? Okay. Okay, this is an interesting one too. Right? A really interesting one too. And complicated in a, in a very interesting way. This involves both race and gender. Right? Again, these concepts are important concepts. Race, we Generally, in this class, we'll be talking about you know, notions of black and white and what that means, relations between the two, uh, and also relations between black and black, or black and African, African and African American. But gender as well, relations between men and women. Right? Issues of gender come up. So he's making a really interesting point here. What do you think about this point? What's he saying? What do you think he's saying here? Don't be scared of your mister. You don't really seem to be scared of my sister. Hmm? There's this idea that black men in particular are seen as particularly threatened. Right? That black men in particular are seen as particularly threatened. Right? I had a professor, he always used to say, what do you call, you know, uh, three black men hanging out in the corner talking? I'm like, what? He's like a gang. I'm like, oh. Essentially, that's how they're viewed, right? More than one is all of a sudden, there's something, they're, what are they up to, right? Now, Part of this may be about stereotyping. Part of this may be about the exaggeration that black women don't necessarily have the same issues that black men do. Because we know that black women do have many of the same issues. We also know that black women have many issues that black men may not have. But it's interesting in this case that you know, he's making this case about this kind of perceived threat. Right? Um, this has been an interesting historical argument. Ida Wells talked about it, right, when she uh, is doing this anti-lynching activism. Black men primarily were lynching victims. 90% of them were male. Uh, more than 90% were male. So Ida Wells is like, why are you so afraid of black men? And at the same time, you're abusing black women. Uh, she's kind of pointing out this gender dynamic. He's making a similar case. Or police. Uh, police tend to, um, you know, you know, black men sometimes maybe differently than black women. I have some friends that um, back home at UCLA that um, sort of made this point. I was talking uh, a good friend I went to, to school with for like 10 years. We were really good friends. And um, I was talking to her because around that time, I had been 
pulled over and detained by the police a couple times. Um, in two weeks, I was detained twice at gunpoint, handcuffed, that kind of stuff. And uh, <laughs> I was telling her about it. She's like, oh, I would have cussed him out. She's like this big, four foot eleven, didn't barely weigh ninety pounds, but she was from Compton, so she didn't play. But if she was loud, cussed him out. This and I was like, you know what? When the guns came out, <laughs> I was kind of like, mm, okay, let's let's not do anything you might regret. You know what I mean? Like I'm not trying to be in the paper right now. Um, afterwards, maybe I'll write a letter or something. Um, but that just wasn't the way I was going to deal with that uh, that night with the guns out. Um, she's like, I've never been pulled over. I'm like, really? Like I moved to Pittsburgh, I got pulled over. 12 times the first year I lived there. It's like it was just a constant kind of thing. It was just a different experience that we had. Yet at the same time, there were other things she had to think about and deal with that I never thought about. I'm going to come back to some of that stuff later. Um, at UCLA, where we went to school, for example, there was a rapist running around. I didn't know anything about it. I was like, that's not my issue. I'm trying to stay away from campus security. <laughs> you know, I'll get to my car. She's like, no, there's a rapist. He raped three, three women. I'm like, really? Didn't even think about it. Gender impacted our experiences differently. We were both black, but our experiences were different based around gender. So it's interesting that he's going to raise something like that and say, okay, um, it's, it's complicated. Your blackness may be impacted by any number of things. Race, gender, class. Obama and I, class is different. Right? Our experiences are going to be very different, uh, perhaps based on that fame, any number of things. Region. Uh, do you live in an urban area or on a farm? All these things might impact your experience, but he's making a particular case and, and really emphasizing gender, which again is interesting in a complicated way. Like, even if you don't agree with it, it's, it's a complicated kind of analysis of this. Yeah. Yeah. Could be both. What do you What do you think? I don't, I don't, what do you uh, think? I mean, it's both. Some still may be, so, but still, you know, like Dr. Uh, uh, Dr. Cook yesterday, mm -hmm. was saying, okay. you, know, you know, I mean, in general, you know, you start talking about African American males and everything else, it's, 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 we receive a threat all the time. I get it all the time. I had the same thing happen to me for no apparent reason, but you look at the incarceration system of all our black, black men are locked up, so they feel like the system is set up where I'm going to take the black man out of the house, or I'm going to take the black man away from community and I'm just destroyed because if you look at it the female can really deal with issues you know when it comes to the group. It's interesting you make I agree with everything you said, but it is complicated in some ways if you if you really want to center it around gender. I'm thinking about when you, you talk about the athletes and things, you know right. and Dominic. Um Serena's and Serena, Serena and Venus Williams. Right. You know, when they came out, there was this whole they're masculine, right? When, when black women are assertive or dominant or aggressive, they're all of a sudden masculine, right? They're not even ladylike. They're not. We'll talk about the history of that as well, because it's interesting how that plays out. Black women are angry, right? <laughs> that's, a, that's the whole stereotype. Of, <laughs> they're always, you know, aggressive, this and that, um, hypersexual, right? All of these things that really have a much longer history are kind of interesting. Um, but also complicated this. I, mean, I don't do, I don't disagree with anything you said, but it is interesting when you flip that lens uh, to think about how this stuff plays out. I remember when uh, Venus and Serena first came out and um, they were playing each other. They were beating nobody else, so they had to play each other, basically. And this was back when they had the braids with the beads in them. One sportswear and it wrote, they were playing each other and it looked like a movie. It looked like the movie Alien versus Predator. So. He just animalized them, <laughs> made them into some crazy. It's just, it's just this crazy sort of reading. And again, media comes into this, stereotype comes into this as well. Um, but it's complicated. Their experiences are different. And it, it, I think gender, in many cases, our discussions of gender may be just as important as our discussions of, of kind of race. The fact that he notices this, I think, is important, right? It gives us something to talk about and think about. I mean, it's something that's on his mind. How do you play that out, say, as a father of? A daughter. Uh, I always thought about this when uh, my mother, I was raised by my mom, and she used to you know, say, okay, if you get in trouble, you know, call the police, this and that, and make sure you're safe. Yet, as a civil rights activist who had been to jail nine times, who had been beaten up by police, she was kind of like, call them, but 
careful. <laughs> I always thought how difficult it must have been for her to raise me. Like, and now I have a four-year-old, so I, you know, I'm sort of figuring some of this stuff out myself. Like, okay, what kind of stuff do I tell him? What kind of stuff do I not, you know, get into yet to keep him safe? It also sort of let him understand that the world is not perfect yet. It's getting better, maybe. You can make that case definitely, but it's still not perfect. Interesting, right? Definitely interesting. In a three-minute song, he's he's laid out some stuff that you know textbooks don't even handle well <laughs> in terms of race, class, gender, media perception, stereotypes, violence, all sorts of things. Anything else about his definition of, of black that comes up? These are good. Yes. Well, he says they focus on a negative attention and do something positive for the negative attention. Okay, they focus on the negative attention, do something positive. It never gets mentioned. How would you analyze that? What's he What's he making reference to there? Mm. <laughs> Thinking about that. Okay. Damn dude, the dabbing on folks, right? Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, media, especially, portrayals. Um, <laughs> negative versus positive. And that's a whole complicated subject, too, that we'll have to revisit. Um, what's popular in popular culture, quite often, it might be negative. Um, but obviously, race is going to come into that, and racism is going to come into that. Um, Michael Vick. Right, so we don't we don't hear about him, you know, visiting children's hospitals and such, right? But we hear about him dancing and sort of pelvic thrusting in a way that's offensive to the fans. And <laughs> that lady that wrote the letter said, you know, I'm really offended. My daughter was here watching the game, and you know, I was watching you dance and your pelvic thrusts. I'd much rather have her watch the cheerleaders. Like, Wait, what? Would you rather have her watch the, the half naked ladies, and that be her role model then, or the only thing she can become? Then this guy dancing in square anyway. But she doesn't have a problem with Aaron Rodgers and the discount double check or <laughs> the other people dancing. It's just read a certain way. It's interesting, right? Both in terms of media and in terms of the larger population. How these things get read are often colored, no pun intended, by race and by other things. Um, so yeah, it's interesting that you would point that out, right? It does not balance. And it's in this part of this we might understand even beyond race, right? We turn on the news today. Like the first five stories are going to be about somebody getting shot. Um, somebody dying, this and that. You know, violence has steadily gone down for the last 20 to 30 years in this country. You wouldn't know it based on watching the news. I got to turn off the news sometimes. <laughs> it's, it's, it's depressing. It's terrifying. Uh, you would think that violence is at an all-time high. It's actually gone down every year. So it's interesting that you, with the sales, right? The whole news phrase, uh, if it bleeds, it leads. Right? That's kind of how you pull in an audience. Often it's about money. It's about we live in a system where you want to make money, right? So maybe some of that could be understood in a lot of different ways. Good stuff. Anything else? There's a lot in here. Obviously, we'll have to talk about all of it or can't talk about all of it. But. Taking it back to his definition of blackness, what I wanted to put out there that was that this was really just one definition. Right? This is one individual male of a certain age, a certain location and time period. This is how he's imagining African-American or black identity. It's how he imagines himself as a part of that community, using what, to use Benedict Anderson's language. What I want to do is, is compare this with another definition, if you um, put this on the back side of this, right? This one may differ in some ways. This one is a spoken word poem by um, a figure that some of you may be familiar with. He's older now, uh, Mr. Smokey Robinson, formerly of the Miracles. Um, he had the spoken word poem on uh, Deaf Poetry Jam a few years back, also talking about um, blackness, right? also talking about blackness. And so I thought it was really interesting to be able to try to compare this, that's what his name was, try to compare the, his definition of blackness or and or African, African American identity with what you just heard. And you'll notice some similarities, but you also may notice some differences. Now, both of them are male, right? so gender is actually the same for both of them. But their ages are very different. Smokey Robinson has to be in his 70s at this point. Um, and he's going to have some, some interesting views, some of which you may agree with, some of which you may disagree with. So if you take, you take a listen, and you have the lyrics also in front of you with this, and um, see what you think. Let me see this. Let you see him. I love being tall black. I love being an American. I love being a black American. 
But as a black man in this country, I think it's a shame that every few years we get a change of name. Since those first ships arrived here in North Africa that came across the sea, there were already black men in this country who were free. And as for those who came up on those terrible boats, they were called niggas and slaves and told what to do and how to behave. And then now she started tripping, doing his midnight tipping down to the slave shacks where he forced he and great great grandma to be together. And the great great grandpa protested, he got tired and fell. And at the same time, the black men in the country were free or made more to tribes like the Apache and the Cherokee. And as a result of all that, we're parade of every shade. And in this late day and age, you can be sure there ain't too many of us in this country whose bloodline is pure. But according to a geological, geographical, genealogy study published in Time Magazine, <laughs> the black African people were the first on the scene. So for what it's worth, the black African people were the first on Earth. And through migration, our characteristics started to change and rearrange to adapt to whatever climate we migrated to. And that's how I became me, you became you. So we're going to go back, let's go all the way back. And if Adam was black and he was black, then that kind of makes it a natural fact that everybody in America is an African American. Everybody in Europe is an African European, everybody in the Orient is an African Asian, and so on and so on. That is, if the origin of man is what we're going to go on. And if one drop of black blood makes you black like they say, then everybody's black anyway. So quit trying to change my identity. I'm already who I was meant to be. I'm a black American born and raised. And Brother James Brown wrote a wonderful phrase. Say it down, I'm black and I'm proud. Say it down, I'm black and I'm proud. Because I'm proud to be black. And I ain't never lived in Africa. And because my great great granddaddy on my daddy's side did, don't mean I want to go back. <laughs> now I have nothing against Africa. It's where some of the most beautiful places and people in the world are found. But I've been blessed to go a lot of places in this world. And if you ask me where I choose to live, I pick America, hands down. Now, by and by, we were called Negroes. And after a while, that name was Spanish. Anyway, Negro is just like you say black in Spanish. <laughs> then we were called colored. We said everybody's one color or another, and I think it's a shame that we hold that against each other. And it seems like we reverted back to a time when being called black was an insult. Even if it was another black man who said it, the fight would result. Because we've been so brainwashed that black was wrong, so even the younger niggas and the black niggas couldn't get along. <laughs> but then came the 1960s, when we struggled and died to be called equal and black, and we walked with pride with our heads held high and our shoulders pushed back. And black was beautiful. But I guess that wasn't good enough. Because now here to come with some other stuff. Who comes up with this shit anyway? Was it one or a group of niggas just sitting around one day? Feeling a little bit of security in about being called black and decided that African American sounded a little more exotic. Well, I think you were being a little more neurotic. It's that same mentality that got English and Andy put off there that they were embarrassed about the way the characters spoke. And as a result of that action, a lot of wonderful black actors ended up broke. When we were just laughing and having fun about ourselves. So I say, fuck you if you can't take a joke. You didn't see the Beverly Hill, but he's been protested by white folks. And if you think, of course you think, that being called African American says all black people's minds at ease, since we affectionately call each other nigga, I affectionately say to you, nigga, please. to make that decision for me. I ain't under your rule or in your dominion, and I'm entitled to my own opinion. Now, there are some African Americans here, but they recently moved here from places like Kenya, Ethiopia, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Zaire. And now the brothers and families lived in this country for generations, occupying space in all the locations, New York, Miami, L.A., Detroit, Chicago, even if he's wearing a dashiki and sporting an afro. And if you go to Africa in search of your race, you'll find out quick, you're not an African American. You're just a black American in Africa taking up space. Or you can to attach yourself to your continent, or even if you got the chance to go and you went, most people there wouldn't even claim you as one of them, as a purebred daughter or son of them. Your heritage is right here now, no matter what you call yourself or what you say. And a lot of people died to make it that way. And if you think America's the leader on inequality and suffering and grievance, how can there so many people coming and so few leaving? <laughs> Rather than all this fine thought that America should you promote, if you want to change them, use your privilege. Get to the polls, come and support them. 
God knows we've earned the right to be called American Americans and be free at last. And rather than you moving forward with progress, you're joining in the past. We struggle too long to come too far. And to the folks that know who we were, let's be proud of who we are. We're the only people whose name is always a trend. When is this shit going to end? Look at all the different colors of our skin. Black is not our color, it's our core. It's what we've been living, fighting, and dying for. But if you choose to be called African American, and that's your preference, then I'll give you that preference. But I'm knowing this issue, I don't stand alone on my own. And if I do, then that may be me. And I'd appreciate it if when you see me, you say, there goes the man who says it loud. I'm black. I'm black. I'm a black American, and I'm proud. But I love being an American. And I love being black. I love being called black. Yeah, I said it. And I don't take it back. All right. Different definitions, right? Definitely different definitions. Uh, what did you hear in his definition of uh, blackness? Obviously, African American is not a label he chooses, right? Um, he says you're a black American, you're not African in that sense. But what do you hear in terms of his definition that's either similar to and or different from um, the previous definition? And why? There might be some reasons why his definition is different. If we think about their backgrounds, for example, they may be quite different from one another in some ways. So what, how is his definition different? Or what is his definition of sort of blackness, um, black identity? How might it be different from what we just talked about or what we just heard? Or do you think it's the same? What is his definition? Let's start there. Your point, this notion of pride or racial pride, and he's making reference to the opposite that um, we, we attach negative connotations to the term black. If any of you saw the movie Malcolm X, uh, he talks about this in the movie where Malcolm goes to jail in 1946, and this really is where he gets educated. By, he talks about reading the dictionary and every uh, reading the word black and every definition of black had negative connotations. It was dirty and uh, evil and uh, all these sorts of things. And the definition of white was pure and this and that. So he's like, start thinking about language and how significant it was and how we have all these negative connotations to it. So both of them kind of make reference to that, which is, is sort of interesting, right? And they both use history to talk about it. He takes it all the way back to Adam and Eve. Uh, in you know, the 60s as well. Uh, he's old enough to have lived through the 60s and civil rights and things where a lot of these categories are changed in this country. Uh, so again, his perspective might be different than say a 30 year old who you know, never you know, grew up with uh, drinking fountains and said black and white, right? So like me and my mother have very different views about certain things because of maybe the, the period that we lived through in some ways. Uh, so that's a good one, both his use of history and this idea of either a racial pride or um, or the opposite, I don't know what the term would be, but uh, negative thoughts about sort of blackness. What else does he say about his view of black? Everybody's entitled their individual opinion of this, right? There's not necessarily one right answer or one way to be black. Um, but it's interesting that they have uh, you know, competing interpretations. So what else does he say? Let's get a couple more. Yeah, he's really making reference to the significance of naming, and, and African American history is full of sort of name changes in terms of the preferred terms. We'll talk about this later on. We'll have a discussion about the use of the N-word um, in some, some detail later in the semester. And one of the things I do when we have that discussion is kind of go through how these names were changed from the 1890s or colored or Afro-American uh, was the preferred term um, to earlier than that, where you didn't have a choice as to what people called you. Uh, 1920s, the term Negro is really the preferred term. W.E.B. Du Bois actually sort of championed the campaign to capitalize the N in Negro to sort of show respect for uh, this racial group in the way that other racial groups, their name is, is capitalized. Um, in the 60s, right, you go from Negro, uh, you know, we heard Malcolm X talk about so-called Negro because he's like, what does that mean? You know, and, and you heard references here, some say that 
how that term Negro was the sort of Spanish derivation of the term Negro, which meant black object in certain respects, not reference to a people, but to a color at all. So a lot of folks really went through a lot of um, um, thought in thinking about that phrase. Um, by the 1970s, Afro-American uh, was the preferred term. Um, African, many people, even if they were not born on the continent of Africa, preferred to be called African by that point, by the 70s and 80s. Today, you almost have to ask people what they want to be called, right? Black, <laughs> African, you can see the term African with a K, kind of political significance to that, to show that you know, politically you have some challenges with the United States and other notions of white supremacy. Um, <laughs> it's interesting, right? Some people prefer black. Some people, you call them black, they want to fight you. Like, what are you talking about? I'm not, you know, I'm not much more brown <laughs> than black. You know, this, it's really interesting. I would say that there's some power in that, first of all, even being able to define what other folks are going to reference you as. For most of African American history, they couldn't make that claim. They couldn't demand that people call them anything. You were happy if they didn't call you N-word. <laughs> right? So it's interesting that there's a power bound up in that. And this is not only true for this, you know, for this particular um, you know, racial or ethnic group. Uh, if you study uh, you know, Latino history, in particular Mexican American history, um, in a place like California, where I'm from, and you know, Mexican American versus, versus Chicano versus, um, I don't want to cause a Caribbean accident, is there's some there's political significance in naming Latino versus Hispanic, uh, these, these sorts of um, labels are important, and especially being defined by yourself, by not having other people, this is what we're going to call you, rather than you know defining it for yourself is really significant and interesting here. Um, so yeah, that's a good point there in terms of the naming as well. <coughs> I put the term audience up here, because both of these, uh, we should consider the idea of audience, and we will consider this idea of audience as we're you know, studying a lot of the things we look at. Right, because these aren't just two guys talking. Right, they're talking with an audience. They're expecting this to be heard. And really widely heard. I um, think about hip hop culture, for example, and the fact that uh, the majority of those that consume hip hop culture are outside the African American community. Uh, some people have said that. Well, that makes hip hop less authentic, right? Because you're writing. You know, you're trying to be successful. If you're trying to make money, you have to keep in mind that you know the primary consumer are young white teenage males. Some folks have said, well, maybe that changes what folks say. Right? So obviously, for the best artists, it doesn't. Right? You're going to put out what, what you believe, and if people like it, cool. If not, whatever. Right? But uh, art that's uh, put out there to be consumed often does change. Right? Or you have to at least think about what the audience is. Does it matter that one's a kind of spoken word poem and one's a hip hop song? Maybe it does, maybe not. But notions of audience are, are going to be significant um, and as we, you know, in the things we talk about this whole semester. Think about slave narratives. Our slave narratives were written before slavery was ended to try to end slavery. So runaway slaves, slaves that had escaped would write their stories and talk about how horrible it was, and abolitionists would publish it and say, look, this is why we need to end this institution. So even though this, these are true stories, they're being written, written for a purpose. Right? They're very political in that sense. And so we need to think about questions like audience. It's one thing to be, you know, singing in your bathroom when no one can hear you. It's another thing to be put some, putting something out for a certain purpose. Um, and sometimes that may change the message, sometimes not. It doesn't always have to change it, I don't think. Um, but you know, sometimes what we say changes depends on who, depending on who's in the room. Right? My boss walks in right now. Maybe I teach a little differently. But probably not, I don't care, I'm not scared of him. <laughs> but maybe it does. You know, sometimes the sometimes the conversation changes. Anything else? And then we'll go on to. You say that to be called an African, at least you have to have a land back in Africa to claim okay. and to be recognized by people. This is important. Here. Yeah. What but do you think about that? That's that's a that's, here, that's a so big. Many years, when you call yourself an African, when you go back to Nigeria and. This is an ongoing debate within the African American community today. Some people say there's a war going, a civil war going on between Africans and African Americans, and folks from the Caribbean, and folks from various places. I gave you the term last week, uh, Pan Africanism. Right? This notion, this idea, a political idea, a political movement that all people of African descent share something in common, a common ancestry, and therefore have something in common. Anderson would say that they're all a part of an imagined community because despite the fact that they might live in D.C. or Brazil or Nigeria or whatever, 
that they all have to deal with white supremacy on some level. They all have to deal with uh, issues that look exactly the same, but they may have something in common. Uh, that's kind of the essence, in a way, of this notion of pan-Africanism. Uh, I gave you the term diaspora, this idea that people have been dispersed throughout the world, but they're still from a common core. Right? He says well, here, it's, it's not our color, it's our core. But then there's the whole other side of that, and he's kind of making that case here, that you, know, you weren't born on the continent, you don't know exactly what area you're from, if you don't know what ethnicity or what you know, region you're from, are you from Dakar, are you from South Africa, right? you don't know. So can you really claim that? Can you really claim that in the same way that, say, an Italian-American that knows exactly what village in Italy their family was from might be able to claim that? I feel like if I claim Puerto Rico, it was my family, but they don't consider me Puerto Rican, even though, mm. yeah, like, if you're from there and you were raised in the States, they call oh, you yeah. New York Rican. They don't, they don't consider okay. you Puerto Rican. Interesting. Yeah. So move that geography is important, that place, that location is important. It's a way of folks to, dis you know, to distinguish, distance themselves. Some people say that's okay. Some people say that might be sad. Like, wait a second. I, you know, if that's my home, if I'm trying to claim that, why should someone be able to not allow me to claim that? Yeah, it's rude. They give me crap all the time when I go there. This is one of the reasons I want to use this imagined community concept, because really, Everybody has to imagine their connection to places they've been before, their home, or their I mean, Irish Americans. Most Irish Americans ain't been to Ireland since the 1890s, right? When most Irish Americans immigrated here, right? True Americans, we Native Americans are the ones that were here. Everybody else immigrated, right? So it's interesting that uh, some groups, you know, might, may have a stronger attachment than others. Yet you understand this as, especially as a result of things like the slave trade, right? Where folks get ripped from where they were from thrown on the ship and taken here and don't necessarily know exactly where they were from, get removed from family and culture and all these sorts of things and have to try to maintain culture or reclaim it, right? So it is a different experience in many respects, but we do understand, I think, that all immigrants have to deal with some of these issues. Okay, well, I'll appropriate to call you Jewish, you know, Jewish Americans, because mm -hmm. I understand where they come from, they can find their history, they know exactly, you know, where their family is from, Yeah, right. it's interesting that term diaspora actually comes out of the Jewish experience, this notion of being spread, but there's an African diaspora that's just as prominent and powerful. A lot of folks have compared the Holocaust experience um, to talk about the Black Holocaust or the African Holocaust and the Middle Passage and whatnot, but like you said, there are even more complications. There, the records are not the same, um, and, and folks can't necessarily trace exactly where they were from. Uh, those concentration camps, you know, may have lasted four or five years, and people died. Um, you know, the, the slave trade lasted hundreds of years, and so it really dislocated people and shattered cultures and whatnot. Yeah, mm. Japanese internment, and other things. Yeah. So it's interesting, but again, this in some ways helps us connect back to a concept like Anderson is giving us, because I think it is a useful concept for all the reasons that you guys are highlighting. Um, this idea about imagining oneself, right, connected to a larger group, may be even more complicated in the case of African Americans. Right? How do they connect themselves to notions of, of community? Um, how do they do that? I mean, can they still do that?